Good morning, everybody. Buenos dias. Uh, please have a seat. It is always uh, a great pleasure to welcome my good friend and partner, uh, President Peña Nieto of Mexico, to the White House and his delegation. Uh, Enrique and I had just worked together at the North American Leaders Summit in Ottawa last month. Uh, today we have two of the three amigos. Uh, although the handshake is a little easier when it's just between two people. <laughs> Let me start by saying something that is too often overlooked, but bears repeating, especially give, given some of the heated rhetoric that we sometimes hear. The United States values tremendously our enduring partnership with Mexico and our extraordinary ties of family and friendship with the Mexican people. Mexico is our third largest trading partner. We sell more to Mexico than we do to China, India, and Russia combined. Every year, millions of tourists and business people and friends and family cross our border legally. Every day, $1.5 billion in trade and investment crosses our border. And that's trade that supports over a million jobs right here in the United States on a whole host of issues from our shared security to climate change, Mexico is a critical partner and is critically important to our own well-being. We're not just strategic and economic partners. We're also neighbors, and we're friends, and we're family, including millions of Americans that are connected to Mexico by ties of culture and of language. And that's why, as president, I've worked to deepen the partnership between our two nations. And today, Enrique and I discussed ways to keep strengthening the U.S.-Mexico partnership. First, through forums like our high-level economic dialogue, we're going to keep working to boost trade and grow our eco uh, economies and create more opportunity for our people. With today's air transport agreement, we're expanding the number of airports that businesses and consumers can fly from which will make travel and trade more affordable and more efficient. Both our countries are working hard to bring into effect the Trans-Pacific Partnership so that our workers can compete on a level playing field across the Asia-Pacific region and can open up doors to new markets. I reiterate to President Peña Nieto that although I am disappointed in the Supreme Court's failure to come to a decision on our immigration executive action, it is my firm belief that it will be in the interests of the United States, especially our economic interests, to pursue comprehensive immigration reform. Second, we are deepening our robust partnership on energy and environmental issues. Both of our nations are committed to ensuring that the historic Paris Agreement is fully implemented. And we're going to keep on working towards the goal that we announced last month in Ottawa generating half the electricity in North America through clean power by 2025. With that goal in mind, we are pursuing an agreement this year on sharing civilian nuclear technology. This fall, our new U.S.-Mexico Energy Business Council will meet for the very first time to strengthen the ties between our energy industries. And Mr. President, I want to thank you for your vision and your leadership in reforming Mexico's energy industry. I'm also pleased that our nations will continue working to protect our shared ecosystems and environmental heritage. Third, we'll continue to protect the health and safety of our people, especially from the opioid epidemic that is taking so many lives and devastating so many communities. Both of our nations, we agreed, share a responsibility to combat this crisis. Here in the United States, we're working to improve treatment and prevention and reduce the availability of illicit drugs. And I applaud President Peña Nieto's commitment to combating organized crime and for developing a new plan to curb poppy cultivation and heroin production. We continue to deploy 21st century technologies to secure our shared border. And uh, as Mexico makes important reforms to its judicial system, we are working together to strengthen law enforcement and to strengthen observance of human rights and the rule of law. Fourth, we're stepping up our efforts to tackle regional and global challenges, from confronting cyber threats to fighting diseases like Zika and Dengue. We'll keep partnering with Central American countries 
to address the instability and poverty that's prompted so many people to embark on the dangerous journey north. And even as we address migration challenges in our own hemisphere, I am very grateful that Mexico is taking uh, an important step uh, on refugee issues and will be co-hosting our refugee summit at the United Nations this September. And finally, we continue to strengthen the strong ties between our people. We want more American students studying in Mexico. We want more Mexican students studying in the United States. So today we agreed to extend and update our educational cooperation. Through efforts like our 100,000 Strong in the Americas Initiative, we're expanding opportunities for educational exchanges and scientific partnerships and research collaborations. And we're working to help girls learn around the world, including Mexico's commitment to support teachers and schools throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. In closing, since this is most likely to be our final White House meeting, uh, I'm reminded of what President Peña Nieto said when he first came here almost four years ago. Uh, Enrique, you said that our nations had a great opportunity to have a closer link of brotherhood, of sisterhood, of collaboration, and of course, of great accomplishments. I am proud of what we've achieved together and proud to stand with you and the Mexican people as our brothers and sisters in progress. And I'm confident that our nations will continue to grow even stronger and more prosperous together in the future. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank President Barack Obama for this very kind invitation to be holding this official visit here at the White House. Perhaps the last one that will be taking place here at the White House during your administration, President Obama. And I would also like to particularly hear say how important this friendship is, the friendship we have always had from President Obama. And he has been, and his administration, they have been very good neighbors. He has been a very good neighbor. And a president committed with the less favored of his country and with stability also and harmony in our hemisphere and with the solution of global challenges, as for instance, uh, climate change, international migration, and the reduction of nuclear weapons. I would also like to recognize in his administration the decisive support of favoring migrants, including the over 35 million people of Mexican origin who live in the United States, who are part of the generation of wealth and employment in this country. I would also like to take advantage of expressing our condolences of the Mexican people, my personal condolences for the lamentable events in Texas and Louisiana. I fully recognize and acknowledge in President Obama, a leader committed in our bilateral relationship, which uh, I should say is uh, today going through one of its best moments and stages in the relationship of the history between our two countries. In uh, this visit, we have agreed to work on an agenda since 2013, a multi-thematic agenda favoring regional competitiveness. We coincided during our meeting this morning on the importance of institutionalizing accomplishments so that they will be lasting throughout time with a bilateral forum on higher education this year, over 64,000 Mexican students will be carrying out academic activities here in the United States. And on the other hand, the high-level economic dialogue with the participation of officials of both administrations of the highest ranking level has undoubtedly become a platform for integration, competitiveness, and growth. And we have also agreed, ladies and gentlemen, in this meeting to give it a permanent character so that the benefits that derive from this dialogue will be extended throughout time. Now we have a joint cargo pre-inspection programs to reduce costs of up to 50 percent. That is half the cost and waiting times that have also been reduced uh, by 60 percent. Uh, we've also implemented this project, this program, 
at the Laredo, Texas airport, at the Mesa Otay Baja border crossing, and soon this will also be operating in Ciudad Juarez. With projects uh, such as this, we're building a safer, more modern, and agile border, a border that undoubtedly generates uh, prosperity for both countries. Uh, under this uh, framework of competitiveness, we're now uh, are celebrating uh, going into effect of the bilateral air agreement uh, favoring connectivity between both countries. Uh, so that as of the moment this agreement goes into effect, we are going to have more flights, more flights that will be better connecting Mexico and the United States. And today we've also formalized the, the Energy Business Council uh, to support Mexico's transition towards a, an open and competitive market. And we said that issues related to security and migration should be analyzed from an integral, comprehensive perspective under the principle of shared responsibility. We coincide in uh, the fact that the consumption and fighting consumption and trafficking and heroin is a priority and that we should find solutions to this challenge. We both face through this. We have created a high-level task force on drugs uh, focused on heroin and fentanyl. And we've also decided to increase our cooperation with the governments of Central America, especially Guatemala, Salvador, and Honduras, so that we can look into migration issues, especially the protection of children that are traveling unaccompanied. Finally, let me refer to the electoral process that's taking place here in the United States. And let me say that um, the closeness between the United States and Mexico is more than just a relationship between two governments. It is a solid, a sound, unbreakable relationship among millions of peoples uh, who live in both nations. Uh, and uh, for Mexicans, for Americans, we are all united by 3,000 kilometers of border with neighboring states, uh, 10 neighbor neighboring states, and with a population of over 15 million inhabitants. And their well-being depends on the well-being of their neighbors. And uh, for the Mexican people, for the Mexican government, the very good relationship with the United States of America is, of course, essential. And from now on, and right here, let me express my absolute uh, will of collaboration uh, to whomever is elected uh, in November as the leader of this great nation. The next uh, madam or uh, president of the United States will find in Mexico and its government a constructive attitude with proposals and good faith to strengthen the relationship uh, between our two nations. I am certain, ladies and gentlemen, that the political process in the following months uh, will be characterized uh, by the intensity of the debate and the contrast of ideas and the vitality of the citizens' participation according to the great democratic tradition that characterizes the United States. The Mexican government will be observing with great interest uh, the electoral process of this country, but it will not give its opinion. It will not get involved in said process. This is an issue that fully exclusively corresponds to the people of the United States. And uh, Mrs. Hillary Clinton and Mr. Donald Trump, uh, I would like to express to both of them my greatest respect, my deepest respect. And from right now, I propose going into a frank, open dialogue with whomever is elected uh, on the relationship between our two nations. I am sure that uh, with the government of the United States, it will be possible to take a step ahead so that we can face common challenges and take advantage of our enormous opportunities that we share, of course, and find solutions, solutions for possible differences. Undoubtedly, for Mexico, it is very important uh, for the United States to do well and for the United States to have a strong economy. And for the United States, it's also very convenient for the Mexican economy to also do well. And 
uh, your next uh, Madam President uh, or President uh, will find in Mexico a strategic partner to face economic security issues that we share and all the challenges that we share. I would like to re reiterate, President Barack Obama, my appreciation for your hospitality, for this fraternal meeting, and for everything, because this is tracing the route and the promise that, that we can continue working together as uh, sister nations and neighbors. And I reiterate my broadest recognition, President Obama, for being invariably a great friend of Mexico. Thank you very much. We've got time for a few questions, uh, starting with Kevin Cork. Thank you, Mr. President. Yeah. Uh, wondering if you had a chance to take in the RNC last night, get your reaction to the uh, comments made by the Republican presidential nominee. And uh, specifically, uh, how do you counterbalance, as we look ahead to Philadelphia, uh, how do you counterbalance what was clearly an appealing message to many working class Americans? And I wanted to drill down also on his comments about the wall. He said, once again, there's a need for a wall. And I ask that question because you and I know that the United States spends tens of millions of dollars on a barrier between our two countries already. So I'm wondering, where does Mr. Trump have it wrong uh, as far as a need for a wall? And you may also know, sir, that your approval ratings are historically high uh, congrats on that. And yet your right track, wrong track, about two thirds of Americans still say we're on a wrong track. Can you sort of square that disconnect? Uh, is that unfair to say that's an indictment of your presidency? Uh, and Mr. <laughs> President, thank you for coming. Um, two simple questions. One, and you kind of touched on this, uh, Donald Trump very well could be the president in January. Uh, how do you work with a person? How do you partner with a person that you've previously uh, compared to Hitler and Mussolini? and specifically on anti-narcotic interdiction and anti-human trafficking interdiction on the border, are you satisfied with the job that you've done as president and what should Mexico be doing more of to help stem the tide? Thank you, gentlemen. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, you know, I want to uh, congratulate the city of Cleveland. Um, Secret Service, local law enforcement that uh, managed you know, a big influx of people uh, and the occasional protester and uh, just a lot of activity uh, and made sure that everybody was looked after, everybody was safe. Uh, I think they did a great job hosting. Uh, second, uh, you know, the, the Republicans had an opportunity this week to share their vision with the country uh, and uh, emphasize those issues that they thought were important. Uh, and I'm going to let uh, the American people judge uh, how persuasive their arguments were. Uh, next week, the Democrats will have an opportunity to present their vision uh, of both the progress we've made and how we make sure that everybody uh, gets opportunity and security uh, in the future. Uh, I noticed a little bit editorializing there, Kevin, when you said, how do I counter uh, a message that was clearly appealing to uh, working class Americans? I don't know if you've talked to all of them. Uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 well, it's, 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 it's the, uh, it, so it's, it's not really clear how appealing it was. We'll find out. That's what our elections are for. Um, I did not watch the convention. Uh, I don't think that's a surprise. I got a lot of stuff to do. Um, and and they, they are pretty long uh, events. Um, but, I, but I did read some of uh, what was said. And the, the one thing that I think is important to recognize is this idea that America is somehow on the verge of collapse, this vision of violence and chaos everywhere, uh, doesn't really jibe with the experience of most people. I mean, I hope people the next morning walked outside and the birds were chirping and the sun was out and uh, this afternoon people would be, watching their kids play in sports teams and go to the swimming pool and 
folks are going to work and getting ready for the weekend. And, uh, and in particular, I think it is important, just to be absolutely clear here, that some of uh, the, the fears that were expressed d throughout the week just don't jibe with the facts. So let's take two specific examples. When it comes to crime, the violent crime rate in America has been lower during my presidency than any time in the last three, four decades. And although it is true that we've seen uh, an uptick in murders and violent crime in some cities this year, the fact of the matter is, is that the murder rate today, the violence rate today, is far lower than it was when Ronald Reagan was president, and lower than when I took office. We've just gone through a tragic period where we saw both you know, tragedy in, in Minnesota and Baton Rouge, and then uh, the insanity and the viciousness of people targeting police officers. Uh, and uh, we are all heartbroken by that, and we're all troubled by how we can rebuild trust, uh, support law enforcement, and make sure the communities feel uh, that they are uh, being fairly policed. But the fact is that the rate of intentional killings of police officers is also significantly lower than it was when Ronald Reagan was president. Now, those are facts. That's the data. When it comes to immigration, I think Americans expect that our immigration process is orderly and it is legal. And we have put unprecedented resources at our border. Well, it turns out that the rate of illegal migration into the United States today is lower by two-thirds than it was when Ronald Reagan was president. We have far fewer undocumented workers crossing the border today than we did in the 80s or the 90s or when George Bush was president. That's a fact. So uh, if the, the one thing that I think is important is, obviously, there are going to be different visions about where we should go as a country, uh, how we can provide jobs, how we can make sure that uh, our kids are able to get the education they need uh, to succeed in the 21st century. You know, how do we deal with our budget? How do we make sure our tax system is fair? How do we deal with very real issues around uh, growing inequality or wages that have not gone up as fast as we want uh, and the real pressures that uh, a lot of families feel? But we're not going to make good decisions based on fears that don't have a basis in fact. Uh, and, and that, I think, is, is something that I hope all Americans pay attention to. America is much less violent than it was 20, 30 years ago. And immigration is much less uh, a problem than it was not just 20, 30 years ago, but when I came in as president. That doesn't mean we haven't solved those problems, but those are facts. Um, I think that covers just about everything. Oh, you had some question about uh, my approval ratings being high and right track, wrong track. Being. I, I think if you look at uh, almost every year under every president over the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years, uh, you're, you're going to be hard-pressed to find a year in which the majority of Americans thought we were on the right track. Maybe because uh, all the good things that are happening in America don't get reported on a lot.
so I don't think that's actually unusual. Uh, but I appreciate you bringing up the fact that my poll numbers are doing okay. Thank you very much, President Obama. Let me reiterate what I said a few minutes ago. The relationship between the United States and Mexico goes over and beyond the relationship between two governments. This is a relationship that has been built as of two peoples who have a, a common life or millions of people who have uh, their everyday lives in both nations. A relationship that undoubtedly involves millions of inhabitants of both countries. I would also like to say, as I've said before, that for the Mexican administration, the democratic process that you live here in the American Union, and for this process, we will always be absolutely respectful. We will not get involved. We will not give our opinion. We will not set any type of position because at the end of the day this corresponds to the people of the United States and it is the American people who have to decide who the next uh, male or female president will be. But what we can say right now is that whomever is elected here as president to the Mexican government will be working in a very constructive manner with good faith. Uh, I'm certain that the relationship uh, between both countries it goes beyond the mere economic environment. And here, President Obama has highlighted uh, many of the such relevant figures that show the vitality of the economic relationship, the trade and commerce relationship between our two nations, the millions of jobs that are generated in the United States and in Mexico as of exactly the economic relationship. Uh, but there's another very important aspect that I should highlight, the good cooperation that we have in terms of security security, not only for the Mexican government to combat uh, organized crime in a more efficient manner, but also for the U.S. government to efficiently fight uh, criminal groups that practically are not respecting any type of border and that are cooperating in both nations. The cooperation in terms of security between Mexico and the United States uh, is also ever-present in the fight against terrorism. We are working so that we can turn North America into a terrorism-free nation and uh, have a part of the world, of course. And this is something we share every day in this uh, everyday cooperation. We share information. We do activities together, and we are always trying to keep North America as a, a region free of the presence of terrorism. Uh, the relationship uh, between Mexico and the United States is very broad and at different fronts. Uh, that is why the attitude and the position of my administration in terms of committing ourselves to continue working with whomever is elected as president of the United States, uh, it is the decision that uh, we are going to respect the decision of the American people. And let me also say that never before have I said anything, have I given any uh, adjective to any of the candidates in the Democratic competition here in the United States. Any issue, anything that I have said has been taken out of context, and uh, especially if we gather everything that has been said on this process, if you see everything that I have said invariably, I have expressed absolute respect for this process, because I reiterate this is an issue that's in the decision of the American people, exclusively of the people of the United States. Resto Gloria. Yes. Good afternoon, Mr. President. Both governments have expressed that they are in favor of the free market and globalization. We've heard some voices that oppose themselves to this paradigm. Candidate Trump has pointed out that he is inclined towards protectionism. My question is, do the legal mechanisms of NAFTA provide it with strength so that it is not put aside by degree? 
And President Obama, I'd like to ask you what pending issues you have in your administration that you have you would have liked to complete. Thank you. I think the free market model of uh, commercial trade openness. Uh, this model has undoubtedly shown enormous benefits for nations, for those of us that follow this model, of course. And let me just say that as of the agreement uh, signed with the United States and Canada, I'm talking about NAFTA, of course, uh, the trade level grew over 500%, 547% to be exact in this uh, last 20 years of NAFTA. And this undoubtedly is reflected in more productive investments in the creation of jobs as well. And it has uh, promoted different projects uh, for the development of infrastructure uh, to make our countries even more competitive. I also think that uh, what is happening is that whenever we've had a slowdown process in the world economy, we start questioning the model. No doubt, however, and this is something I'm fully convinced of, no doubt that uh, this model Mexico has followed and promoted and fostered, well, it has had a particularly important strategic partnership with the U.S. and Canada. This is a model that still promises a lot of things so much for the benefits of our citizens because it allows us to consolidate the North American region as a more competitive region with a lot more investment and which we are really taking advantage of opportunities to build uh, labor possibilities for our peoples. This is really something we have to highlight and underline and uh, bear in mind uh, because it represents so much and this agreement is projecting into the future, of course, uh, free trade, of course. Right now we can say that this is something that we have had now for 20 years. And I think there are also conditions to modernize, to update, uh, and uh, to find uh, more advantages so that it will potentiate uh, shared common possibilities that we, the three partners, the three strategic partners have. I'm talking about Mexico, the United States, and Canada. I believe that this agreement, this agreement, which is also strengthened uh, uh, through TPP, which is now about to be approved in the different countries, and outwardly they potentialize, uh, they boost, uh, and they create a highly promising platform for economic development and for the benefits this will constitute for our societies. I think the mechanism of uh, it's already in the purpose uh, i think the position of the united states is that after 20 years of having nafta we now have eventually the conditions to modernize it to update it, uh, nafta and potentialize this uh, agreement even more uh, I, I agree with enrique uh, that uh, one of the values of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, uh, is that we've learned uh, from our experience in NAFTA what's worked, what hasn't, where we can strengthen it. Uh, and a number of the provisions uh, inside of the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, address some previous criticisms of NAFTA and uh, will make what is already an extraordinarily strong economic relationship between our two countries even stronger. And we'll make sure that the process of uh, global integration is serving not just uh, large companies, but is helping small companies and small businesses and workers. So uh, what I've said consistently is that globalization is a fact because of technology, because of an integrated uh, global supply chain uh, because of changes in uh, transportation. And we're not going to be able to build a wall around that. What we can do is to shape how that process of global integration proceeds so that it's increasing opportunity for ordinary people, so that it's creating 
better jobs, so that we are strengthening protections for workers, so that we are addressing uh, some of the environmental challenges that come with rapid growth. And you know, for us to look forward and, and find ways in which we uh, shape uh, this new direction uh, of the global economy in a way that benefits everybody, rather than to look backwards and think that we can undo what is uh, what has taken place, I think, is our best strategy. Um, and for all the talk about uh, starting trade wars or uh, increasing protectionist barriers between countries, when you actually examine uh, how our economies work, uh, auto plants in the United States, for example, would have a very hard time producing uh, the number of automobiles they produce, and they've been having record years over the last several years, if they're also not getting some supplies from companies in Mexico. Uh, and companies in Mexico are not going to do well if they don't have some connection to uh, not just markets, but also suppliers uh, and technology from the United States. Uh, so we have to focus on how do we ensure the economy works for everybody and not just the few? There are dangers that globalization increase inequality. Uh, there are dangers that because capital is mobile and workers are not, if we are not providing them sufficient protection, that they can be left behind in this process. Uh, and that's what we have to focus on. Uh, and uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is consistent with that. Okay. Julian Elper. President Obama, given the fact that the government of Turkey is asking for the extradition of Turkish cleric Fethullah Gülen, how are you weighing that decision? How do you view allegations that he helped foment the recent coup and that Turkish intelligence officials have said that they believe U.S. intelligence services had direct knowledge of the coup's planning? Also, with the detention of more than 10,000 Turks, the firing of thousands more, and uh, a ban on overseas travel by academics then there, at what point do you need to speak out more forcefully about these tactics? Mm -hmm. I did my undergraduate thesis on the PRI and the legacy of the revolution and how that shaped your nation's politics. Pero lo siento, voy a platicar en inglés. The question for you is that you've mentioned your efforts to address heroin and, and the trafficking and the transfer to the United States. Could you talk a bit more about the challenges that you face in disrupting this illegal trade, particularly given the fact that often it's transported in small amounts, making the kind of large bus that Mexico and the U.S. have collaborated on in terms of other illicit drugs more difficult? And in addition, you, like President Obama, have made climate change a top priority. Can you talk about the biggest obstacles you face there in achieving your climate goals and how climate impacts are affecting your country and the future relationship between the U.S. and Mexico in terms of migration and other factors. Gracias. So, Juliet, uh, uh, first of all, I had a chance to talk to President Erdogan this week uh, and reiterated uh, what we said from the earliest reports that a coup uh, was being attempted in Turkey, and that is that we strongly reject any attempt to overthrow uh, democracy in Turkey, that we support the democratically elected government there. Uh, and uh, I think one of the uh, signs of great strength in the Turkish people was the fact that even strong opponents of President Erdogan uh, when reports of the coup were taking place and when it was still uncertain uh, who exactly was behind it, uh, even opponents of President Erdogan pushed back hard against the idea that the military uh, should overthrow uh, a democratically elected government. Uh, any reports that we had any previous knowledge of a coup attempt, that there was any U.S. involvement in it, that we are anything other than entirely supportive of Turkish democracy, 
are completely false, unequivocally false. And I said that to President Erdogan. And I also said to him that uh, he, need to make, he needs to make sure that not just he, but everybody in his government understand that those reports are completely false. Uh, because when rumors like that start swirling around, uh, that puts our people at risk on the ground in Turkey. And it threatens what is a critical alliance and partnership between the United States and Turkey. So uh, I, I want to be as clear and unequivocal as I can be. We deplore the attempted coup. We said so earlier than just about anybody and have been consistent throughout that the Turkish people deserve a government uh, that was democratically elected. Now, uh, what is true is, is that uh, President Erdogan and Turkey uh, have a strong belief that Mr. Golan, here in the, uh, who's in Pennsylvania, a legal resident of the United States, uh, uh, is somehow behind some of these, uh, some of these efforts. And what I said to President Erdogan is the same thing that I would say to you uh, and anybody else who asks, which is we have a process here in the United States for dealing with uh, extradition requests uh, made by foreign governments. And it's governed by treaties and it's governed by laws. And uh, it is not a decision that I make, but rather a decision that uh, our Justice Department and investigators and uh, courts make alongside uh, my administration in a very well-structured uh, and uh, well-established process. So uh, the, the, I told President Erdogan uh, that uh, they should present us with evidence that they think uh, uh, indicates uh, the involvement of Mr. Golan or anybody else who, who's here in the United States, and it would be processed the way that it is always processed, uh, and that we would certainly take any allegations like this seriously. But America is governed by rules of law, uh, and those are not ones that uh, the President of the United States or anybody else can just set aside for the sake of expediency even when uh, we are deeply supportive of Turkish democracy and even when we care deeply about uh, uh, any attempts to overthrow their government uh, or any other illegal actions, uh, we've got to go through a, a legal process. Um, finally, with respect to uh, what's happening in the aftermath of the coup attempt, uh, in my conversations with uh, President Erdogan, I think in statements by John Kerry and others, uh, what we have indicated is uh, our strong belief and hope that uh, as the dust settles, there is not uh, a overreaction that could in some fashion uh, lead to uh, a curtailment of civil liberties or uh, a weakening of the ability of legitimate opposition uh, or journalists through uh, legal processes to voice their concerns uh, and to petition their government. Uh, and that the United States, uh, as a friend and partner of Turkey's, uh, and me personally, as somebody who's worked with President Erdogan uh, for a long time now, uh, would encourage that uh, the manner in which this coup is investigated and people are held accountable uh, and justice is done uh, is consistent with uh, rule of law uh, and uh, the basic freedoms that I think the Turkish people uh, have fought for and defended. Uh, and, and obviously, you know, we can't discount how scary and shaken 
not just the Turkish government is, but uh, Turkish society is. Imagine if you had some rump group of military officials here in the United States who started flying off with F-16s or uh, other artillery and were taking shots at government buildings and people were killed and injured, uh, people would be scared, uh, and right, rightfully so. Uh, but one of the challenges of a democratic government uh, is making sure that even in the midst of emergencies and passions, uh, we make sure that rule of law and uh, the basic precepts of justice uh, and liberty prevail. Uh, and my hope is, is that that is what will uh, emerge. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we will continue to work with Turkey uh, even as they try to stabilize the situation. Uh, the, our base at Inserlik, uh, from which we are going after ISIL hard, uh, is up and running as, uh, again, and we continue to work with them uh, to make sure that uh, we don't lose momentum uh, that we've built in terms of weakening ISIL's position in Syria uh, and uh, to try to strengthen the prospects for some resolution of that, uh, that terrible conflict. Thank you very much for your question because it allows us to show uh, and to talk about a subject matter we have agreed and something that I mentioned in my first participation in this meeting, which is exactly that related to the creation. Uh, as a matter of fact, since we met in Canada a few days ago, uh, creating a high-level group uh, uh, to define mechanisms uh, to combat the production of poppy, opium poppy cultivation, and also opium uh, gum and heroin coming into the United States, which is the situation uh, clearly today. What is reality all about? We see that there's a growing production in some parts of the geography of Mexico where there are conditions for the production of this crop. And there's also a growing introduction of heroin here in the United States. Well, this is uh, the information we have right now. That's why we have to get together to build. We have to continue working together to find a solution to eradicate uh, crops uh, and to have uh, alternative uh, crops, uh, conversion of crops, and create mechanisms that will allow us to uh, face up to the scorch, which has uh, taken the life of uh, hundreds of people, uh, especially here in the United States. Uh, what we have agreed on is to work together and to define the route we're going to be following. I insist uh, to avoid uh, this uh, poppy crops from extending to other parts of the Mexican geography whenever that is possible and thus be able to reduce, to diminish, to reduce and avoid uh, the growing uh, entrance of heroin in the United States. But I think this uh, topic shows something else. It shows us the need of working together. It also shows the need both countries have to face up to problems that are common problems. And uh, uh, crops of uh, poppy in Mexico, which is the base for heroin production, undoubtedly is uh, taking place uh, in places where there's a violence as of the production of these crops. And of criminal groups as well, who've become stronger through the introduction of illegal weapons, uh, guns in our country, guns, uh, firearms coming from the United States into Mexico. Unfortunately, well, this is encouraging, uh, uh, increasingly encouraging uh, the opium poppy cultivation in Mexico. I repeat, this is a common problem because it generates a problem of violence in our country and strengthening of criminal groups in our country as well. And the introduction of heroin here in the United States that has taken the lives of uh, thousands of people in this country. But what you have said uh, 
is one of the many subject matters that are on the shared agenda between our two countries. I mean, the need of having and attending to this in a joint fashion. These uh, issues show the need uh, to work in a very close manner, in a constructive uh, manner, in a very positive way to look into this jointly, us two governments to look into problems that are affecting both societies. And this is exactly what we've decided to do. I want to thank President Barack Obama for his political will so that we can create this high level working group, uh, this task uh, force to find the best solutions for this phenomenon. Cecilia Telles of the Cronica newspaper. Good afternoon, President. You spoke about the need to institutionalize the agreements reached thus far between both nations. Besides the free trade agreement, which is this agenda of subjects taking into account the change in administration in the United States? I'd like to ask you whether you have discussed the extradition of Chapo Guzman as well. When we speak about institutionalizing mechanisms uh, between both countries, it is uh, for them to be durable throughout time. There are uh, three particularly important mechanisms that undoubtedly are now allowing us to have a very positive, constructive relationship uh, in both nations. First, uh, the high-level economic dialogue, the HLED, that involves the highest ranking officials of both administrations that are working in favor of creating a route, a path for infrastructure construction in our borders, uh, infrastructure which is a lot more modern infrastructure that will allow to have more agile trade and commerce between our two nations. And in terms of security, uh, something that uh, I have already said uh, as many of the other subject matters, under responsibility, uh, security cooperation allows us to fight together jointly criminal organizations operating in both countries and maintaining a safe border. It all uh, comes from this uh, high level dialogue that we have. And surely, academic exchanges. Uh, academic exchanges seek to, to have more students from Mexico to be able to come to the United States to get their training, their education here, and uh, North American students to be able to go to Mexico. And this has been a growing impetus. Uh, the number of students, it's 64,000 right now. Three years ago, it was 15,000 Mexican students who were coming here to study in the United States. It's precisely of this uh, decision. We've decided to continue on this path and to continue promoting it. And the third thing here is the mechanism to implement uh, innovation, technology, and infrastructure in North America. This is a mechanism that's allowing us to really identify areas of opportunity uh, to enhance uh, value chains, productive chains, uh, and also supply chains that are there for the production in the United States as well as in Mexico. In fact, we've already defined a clusters mapping process so that we can really promote the economic activity in both nations and how can we strengthen this relationship, of course. And this is another mechanism generated as of the the commitment and the will of uh, President Obama's administration. So the relationship between our two countries is not a monothematic relationship, just uh, focusing on security. But we wanted uh, to really try to launch efforts in both governments uh, to promote competitiveness and productivity of the United States, of Mexico, of North America as a whole, and to really promote and foster this region so that it can become the most attractive region for investments, economic growth, and uh, productivity and development. And for that, we have to be working in common fronts, especially in joint projects that are jointly defined that will also allow us to really comply with this uh, purpose and objective. A summary of uh, what we mean when we say uh, the need to institutionalize uh, the relationship. I think it's very important to remember that so much of the work that gets done between countries uh, is not done at the level of presidents, uh, but is done within various agencies, 
whether it's law enforcement or uh, economic ministries, and uh, when they establish relationships and systems of communications and uh, uh, shared projects and shared visions, uh, those uh, st structures continue uh, even after any particular president is gone um, and build trust and understanding between countries uh, that are, are critically important. And, and this gives me a good opportunity, I think, to emphasize uh, that throughout my presidency, uh, both with President uh, Peña Nieto uh, and with his predecessor, uh, we have had consistent, strong communications, uh, collaboration, where there have been differences or tensions, uh, we have consistently tried to work through them in a constructive, positive way. Uh, and you know, to take a, an example of something that uh, obviously always gets a lot of attention, uh, the issue of the border, uh, a lot of the undocumented workers or uh, migration flows that we've seen over the last several years aren't coming from Mexico, but are coming from Central America. And if it were not for the hard work of Mexico in trying to secure its border to the south and to cooperate with us, we would have a much more significant problem. Uh, and that's not always easy. That requires resources and uh, you know, policy decisions made by the Mexican government, uh, but the cooperation on that front has been absolutely critical in making sure that we deal with these issues in a serious way and in a humane way, uh, and we continue to make progress on that front. The same is true when it comes to uh, uh, drug trafficking. This is a problem of both of our countries, and as a consequence of the work that we've done together, we have seen progress in some areas, both in the flow of drugs north, but also in the flow of guns uh, and illicit uh, financing south. Uh, but we're not going to be able to solve this problem by ourselves, and Mexico is going to need the United States to cooperate in order to rid itself of uh, the violence and corruption that results from the drug trade. Uh, and so the more we can build uh, these kinds of uh, habits of cooperation uh, and ingrain them in our uh, various agencies, uh, the better off we're going to be. And, and I, I want everybody to be very clear. Uh, Mexico has been a consistent, strong partner with us on these issues. And if they had not been, we would have had much bigger problems on our borders, and the, the, the benefit of a cooperative Mexico, and by the way, a Mexico that has a healthy economy, a Mexico that can help us build stability and security in Central America, that's going to do a lot more to solve uh, any migration crisis or drug trafficking problem than a wall. And uh, it'll be much more uh, reflective of the kind of relationship that we should have with our neighbors. Yeah. Mr. President, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it.